Good morning. Well, church, here we are again uh, in lockdown. And I am so grateful that we have a, a government that is able to take quick action and protect us in this way. So some things are removed from us, but uh, the most important things are still with us, both our safety, but also the presence of God. And we celebrate the presence of God today. In some ways, this is uh, symbolic of Lent. And you see the purple cloth here. We're starting the season of Lent on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, Shrove Tuesday on Tuesday. Uh, if you want to have a pancake, um, then that's uh, traditionally the time to have it. So uh, I think we'll have pancakes on Tuesday. So uh, if you do too, know that uh, someone else is doing the same thing with you. In season of Lent, you know, some people, uh, for those traditions who have Lent, um, uh, sometimes it's seen as a, uh, a bit of a miserable time in which self-examination, you pluck out all the things that are wrong in your life, etc., and you, you sit like Job in your misery and dwell on them. Uh, that's not what Lent's about at all. Lent is about setting aside time with God. The passage we're about to have later, Jesus going into the wilderness uh, and he was tempted in the wilderness, in some ways is symbolic of Lent. It's a time of removing the distractions through prayer and fasting, through spiritual discipline, through disciplining yourself, removing the distractions so that you can look at your life and get it back on track in God's grace it's a time in one sense of celebration because Jesus goes with you into the wilderness and is there to help build you up. Lent is an opportunity and that's how we should see it. Not just a tradition, um, not just purple cloth and, and um, uh, symbols. It's a time and an opportunity for you. So uh, even as we're in lockdown now, um, that is an opportunity as well. Look on the positive side of what it gives you, not so much what it takes away. That is ideally what Lent is about. So during this time, which is in the lead up to Easter, we've got our Lenten studies, of course, and we're quite excited about that. So um, uh, it's going to be talking about some of the uh, conflicting ideas that battle for control of our lives. So uh, look for that later on. Uh, other things are, are not happening in the life of the church. So there's no ladies' dinner, of course, on Tuesday night. And also there's no, um, well, I should say, we're waiting till Monday or Tuesday. We think it's unlikely the church camp will go ahead. But look for the email, because if all goes well with the lockdown, there's no further cases, then it's possible. So, and that is our prayer, of course. Now, let's hear a, a poem by Ruth Burgess as we lead into prayer. The desert waits, ready for those who come, who come obedient to the Spirit's leading, or who are driven because they will not come any other way. The desert wilderness always waits, ready to let us know who we are. The place of discovery. And whilst we fear, and rightly, the loneliness and emptiness and harshness, we cannot forget the angels whom we cannot see for our blindness, but who come when God decides that we need their help, when we are ready for what they can give us. Let us pray. Our God, help us to decide now to join you out in the wilderness, the place where God is discovered, in Mount Sinai, in burning bushes, the place where God is met as Christ himself in the wilderness. O oh Lord our God, help us not to be afraid of silence and stillness. These are our friends. Help us not to be afraid of self-examination, scared of what we might find, or worried that 
we will not have the resources to cope with what we find. O Lord, instead, let us lean into the fresh gift of the Holy Spirit given to us in baptism. Lean into your grace and kindness. Help us lean into this space knowing that whatever is needed, you will provide. O Lord, go with us now, whether it's to discover repentance or new gifts or new directions. May you bless this Lenten time of 2021. And as we go, we pray your blessing on all the life groups that we may go with companions. We thank you for them. We pray all of this in the name of Christ our Saviour. Amen. from Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 to 11 well, it's found in the New International Version Jesus is tested in the wilderness then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil after fasting 40 days and 40 nights he was hungry the tempter came to him and said if you are the Son of God tell these stones to become bread Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendour. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan! For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. In this reading is the word of the Lord. Some people wonder what Lent is about. Here's a story that might help. One day there was a powerful woman who owned a business and she had a son. And together... They built a ship, and the ship was a mercy ship that was going to go around the world and help people wherever it went, a ship of compassion and love. They hired a crew and put them aboard, and then all they needed to do 
was find supplies and then it would be ready to sail. So they went off to get the supplies and they left the crew in charge to mine the ship, her ship, while they were gone. But after some time, they were gone a while. So they did some fishing and then they played some games and, and then they started to binge watch at the local cinema, at the local theatre. And at this theatre, they were playing repeated episodes of that old Shakespearean play, Frozen. I think they were up to Frozen 7 this time. And as they watched, they got engulfed in the story. Christoph to Anna. Oh my Anna, I love you. Now is the time for our love. Oh Christoph, it cannot be. Now is not our time. Oh Anna, say that it's not so. Yes Christoph, it is not so. Oh Anna, you have frozen my heart. Oh Christoph, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. And so after many, many episodes of Frozen and of watching, they began to forget what they were there for. They began to think that it was their boat and they weren't just the crew, but they were the owners. So a strange thing started to happen and they changed the boat to the way they wanted it to be. And this is what they did. They decided that they would turn the Mercy ship into a cruise ship. A love boat, if you will, for leisure time, for hanging out and having drinks and in the pool, hanging out in the spa and just socialising with one another. And, and life was all about having a good time for themselves. But it didn't take long before other people on the crew decided they wanted to use the ship for different purposes. And so the angry men of violence came and this is how they changed it. They decided to remove the owner's flag and to put on their own flag and turn it into a pirate ship. A ship of violence to take other people's things. And they put in a cannon and they came with their weapons, angry men who wanted to take the ship for their own. And that's what they did, scaring everyone in their path. It was at this moment that the owner's son came on the scene. He was shocked because he had come to tell them to ready the ship because the supplies were coming and they were about to embark on their mercy of mission and love to the world. So he told them a message. He told them that they had to repent and change their ways. They had to admit that it was actually the owner's ship and not theirs and that they had to live by the, the charter of compassion and love, not their own way. And so they had a decision to make. Would they live by the owner's way or would they reject the message? So of course this story is not really about a boat, it's about the world and who owns this world and whose it is and how will we use this world for the owner or for ourselves? What will you do this Lent? Good morning. Welcome to a time of prayer as we come together to pray for the world. My name is Alastair. I'm an elder here at Living Faith Church. And today's prayer is inspired by Matthew chapter 5, and in particular, verse 25, which reads, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. And so... As we come before God, Lord, it seems this week that we and our fellow Christians 
have been surprised by the consequences of our behaviour yet again. This seems to be an ongoing thing that we just do over and over again. And so I want to pray for the things that we will really struggle to give up for Lent, the things that we really need you, Lord, if we are going to have a chance at doing this. Those things are our recklessness, our cruelty, our laziness, and our greed. And so, God, I bring to you, I bring to you climate change. I bring to you abusive and incompetent leaders who we continue to elect, to support, to defend, to re-elect over and over again. I bring to you our love of misinformation and conspiracy that we return to like a dog to its own vomit, whatever the cost to ourselves, to our families, to those around us. Lord, help us. I bring to you our habit of building walls and the cost that that has on the people we exclude and the people we imprison within those walls, within our walls that we seem to be so proud of, despite all the destruction. Lord, we bring before you our pandemics, born out of our own recklessness, cruelty, laziness, and greed. Our pandemic, such as COVID, which look, brings us into lockdown in Melbourne once again. But also our financial crashes, our racism, our sexism, our love of authoritarianism. Lord, when will we change? And so, God, we know the consequences, and yet also we do not. We continue to pretend that these are one-off, isolated events, and not the continual product of our recklessness, our cruelty, our laziness, and our greed. And we are sorry. We are truly, deeply sorry, and we are doing our best. And yet, also we are not. We are not sorry. And we are not doing our best. And we will not give these things up for Lent. Not without you. And so my prayer for the world is that there will be a difference between Christian and non-Christian. Not in space, not in relationship, but in heart. That there will be something different about us that shows that you are worthwhile, that makes our witness worth something. And I pray that you will protect the world from us and you will protect... You will protect us from us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Good morning, LSC. Welcome back to my shed as we once again move into lockdown. Hopefully it's a one-of, but we'll, it's a bit of a wait and see, isn't it? But the good thing is that we can still gather, even if it's pre-recorded rather than live or in the chapel. This week is the beginning of our Lenten series that's been scheduled for 2021. So this is session one of our study series. It speaks to the idea of fasting and idolatry. Fasting and idolatry, two words that don't really get traction in our first world setting. Um, fasting, who does that? Monks, very spiritual people those who are trying to get off junk food or modify their eating patterns, dieting. Who does this? 
And this word idolatry, what is idolatry anyway? Given our contemporary postmodern self serving anything goes world, what is it? It seems to me whatever becomes the new norm in our society, in our culture, inevitably creeps into our church and uh, becomes either accepted or tolerated in the background. And you could probably think of a few of your own examples rather than me speaking to it. In churches, fasting is predominantly done as a method to raise awareness of a particular vital issue, uh, make a donation to some worthy cause, and that is all good. That's a good thing. But smaller number of individuals, fasting is a pathway to think, reflect more deeply about seeking, discerning matters of faith and life. An encounter with our Creator God, which is also a really good thing. I remember as a younger fella, you know, the uh, World Vision 40 hour famine. It was pretty big. That's my recollection anyway, across most denominations. And, and most people participated in it. It still operates, it still gets promoted, but I don't know if it has the same coverage that it used to have. Uh, you might challenge that. Maybe I'm just getting older and I'm a bit detached from the process. But anyway, I did it for a few years. And I remember the last time I did it, uh, it came around, I signed up, as you do within your church setting. And uh, we hit the weekend and it was, I think it was a Saturday night. And I went out with some mates. We went roaring around town on a motorbikes, yahooing, l legally, of course. And then it got to about midnight and we got back to Watsonia. And then the boys decided they were going to go to Chris's Hamburgers in Greensboro, for those who might remember Chris's Hamburgers. a very colourful place. Lots of entertaining stuff happened at Chris's Hamburgers. And I buckled, I weakened. I managed to convince my mum to complete my 40-hour famine and I went and had hamburgers with the boys and the justification that I was young and a tradie and I needed my fuel. It was quite pathetic, really. But anyway, that's my little grab at fasting. When I think about idolatry, well, you've got to conclude it's alive and well in our culture, isn't it? We have so many competing, compassion, uh, competing passions and interests and activities that we so easily get caught up in. And often those things that we do, our passion or interests or become, they bolster our, our insecurities, our self-worth, our identity, maybe our kudos. And I certainly see this in the bike scene. I've been around the bike scene a long time. And I'm constantly confronted by blatant expressions of idolatry. Expensive, loud, proud motorcycles. Then you have the classic stereotypes, big arms. I missed out on that one the tattoos, the garb that they wear, whether it's leather or other, you know, sort of big and bold statements, look out, I'm here. And within clubs, particularly one percent of clubs, they're, they're, uh, it's about power, control, dominance, and really strong characters within that setting. And of course, there is that element that uh, about high drug use, high risk lifestyles, it's all part of the package. And of course, the rule of thumb is high risk lifestyles usually end poorly. And I can think immediately of a few experiences of that of people that I've known. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some really deep thinking, intelligent, reflective characters within the bike scene too. I often know how to call a spider shovel. They'll go to toe to toe on any academic argument, but they just see the world differently. And that's an attraction to that particular subculture for me. Now, in our study series, Jim Wallace makes the observation that during the plight of economic downturn in the US, which inevitably whatever happens in the US has a ripple effect across the globe in our first world countries, in particular Australia, is of a direct effect of idolatry. So what's he saying? 
He suggests we have replaced God with the invisible hand of the market, substituted market value from moral values. And we now live in a world that even questions the value of having moral values. Everything's turned upside down. This is also high risk and will end poorly if we keep going down that path. Hmm. Let's get to our temptation of Jesus. Interestingly, all three gospel writers seem to stress the immediacy of the temptation followed the baptism of Jesus. Mark, as he does, he's really frank, and he states that once the Spirit sent him out into the desert wilderness, or desert wilderness, depending on your version. That's it. That's the statement. And it seems to be one of the truths of life that after an amazing adrenaline rush experience, there comes a moment of reaction in our human condition. And often we find it is in the reaction that danger can lie. Remember the story of of Elijah in 1 Kings? The amazing courage to have a crack at the prophets of Baal. You remember that story? There's like 450 prophets of Baal and then there's a whole lot of other prophets from another god that was being followed. And Elijah does a number on them, a comprehensive victory to Yahweh. And, he, and Elijah's smack in the middle of it. And he's running on adrenaline. The success. And then the bongo drums beat and a fiery Jezebel wants his head. And Elijah freaked. What did he do? He ran. He up and ran. And he ran. And he ran. And he ran until he collapsed. The angel had to come and patch him up and keep him going. Inevitably, he hides in a cave and he's lonely, afraid. His moment of reaction had come. I don't know, something about Murphy's Law, just after our hour of resistance and power, has been at its highest. We nosedive something in the heightened state. The tempter carefully, subtly, skillfully chooses a time, a place to get under our skin, in our heads, just as he attempted to do with Jesus. Poking, prodding, finding the human element, vulnerability, weakness. Life teaches you when things are travelling well, really, really well, just around the corner. It can all change shape. Yet the beautiful thing about the temptation of Jesus, he conquered. And we do well to be specifically on guard after every time we do well. After every time we... uh, are at the heights of success. For it's then that things can easily go belly up if we're not kept in check. Now in our Lenten series study, there is a quote from Diana Butter, uh, Butler Bass. I do love this quote, and it's this. The journey to Easter is not a mournful denial of our humanity. Rather, Lent embraces our humanity, our deepest fears, our doubts, our mistakes and sins, our grief and our pain. It does. It's all part of the mix. Lent is also about joy, self-discovery, connecting with others, doing justice. Lent is not morbid church service or morbid church services. It's about being fully human and knowing God's presence in the crosshairs of blessing and pain. And it is about waiting waiting in those crosshairs for resurrection. I love it. Something about embracing our flawed human nature with all its failings and transitioning to self-discovery. Joy. Being at peace with our own quirkiness. Therefore being able to, out of that quirkiness, do justice and connect with others in, in spite of that stuff. I reckon fasting and idolatry are inherently linked. When you fast, you find out what's important to you. When you stop drinking alcohol, a friend of mine at the moment is doing exactly that. Now this friend 
He's not someone that drinks excessively. But what this friend of mine has noticed, that their lifestyle started to have to adapt around the drinking, you know, just one or two in the evening because you're in a professional form of employment, high stress, to a way to relax, you know. Who doesn't like a glass of red or what with their meal? But when it becomes habitual, when it becomes demotivating, when it starts to impact on your health, when it starts to work for evil rather than good, you've got a problem, haven't you? Whether it's drinking alcohol, eating the wrong food, maybe it's obsessive cleaning is your thing, maybe hoarding. What is it you replace it with and is it going to be better for you or put you in the same place? Does it honour God and the people around you and yourself? You see, fasting from editing gives you an opportunity to reflect, to peel open, to peel back the layers and ask yourself the raw question, what does my meaning come from? What really matters here? Who am I? What is my identity? Where is my security? Back to our text. Really interesting to note that the meaning of the word tempt in the Greek word, I'm going to spell it out and I cannot pronounce it. I've heard it pronounced and it has about, has a number of layers to it and expressions that I just don't get. I'm a bit dyslexic or something. It's spelled P E. I-R-A-Z-E-I-N. The English word tempt inherently has has a bit of a negative connotation, doesn't it? A bad meaning. It implies someone is going to be, you know, seducted to sin, as it were. Persuasion to a wrong turn or something like that. But there is strength in this Greek word that that I can't pronounce. That is to test as much as it is to tempt. According to one old writer, William Barclay, you take the famous Old Testament story about how narrowly Abraham escaped sacrificing his son Isaac. A familiar phrase is used in both stories, that of God testing and tempting. And depending on your version of Abraham, God is certainly not going to tempt in the negative to bring someone to fall or sin, rather to test, to tempt, to strengthen, no, the Iron sharpening iron type picture. Was it the supreme test of loyalty of Abraham? In the case of Jesus, was tempted, tested by the devil and was submitted to the very real challenges, therefore disciplines of being human with all the fundamental basic needs of physical survival as well as the human emotional, psychological hungers. Need for kudos, status, power, need for security. Jesus was triumphant because of his security in knowing his place with his creator God. So we are also called to know our security and place in and with our creator God. And maybe, maybe we're called to reframe what it means to be tempted, to be tested. Maybe it can be an empowering thing. But it comes from practice of what? Fasting. Of identifying the things that are idolatrous in your life. Being able to replace them with your security and peace within our created God. Now I know we're in lockdown at the moment and we're hoping it won't be for long. I want to encourage you, if you haven't signed up to the series, i really encourage you to do that hook in with an existing life group and if we can't do the face-to-face thing then we'll just do the zoom and I was offering a group for Wednesday morning so that group may have to go to zoom if this continues but otherwise come and join us come and unpack this come and peel back have a look at what's happening for yourself I read an article last night I actually stumbled across it I was just bored and I picked up my mobile phone, you know, another addictive habit that we all can have. And somehow I landed on this article and it was about a Pentecostal church that has recently gone through a bit of an internal 
upheaval and which led to an individual being having forced to resign. And the picture that it gave was that this particular person was a bit of a favourite, uh, an up and coming, had studied within this movement, had moved into leadership in this movement and over years was a colourful character. You know, he had that presence, he had the looks, he had the gift of the gab, inevitably he became a leader and he found himself being invited and he'd preach four or five times a day and then at the end of that he would go and relax and he'd have his exclusive little group and they would go out and have a fine meal and share some drinks. Well, of course, this fine meal and sharing drinks an exclusive little group. Now, I'm paraphrasing what I read. Escalated into more than that, where it became excessive use of alcohol and then some of the inappropriate behaviour that went with that. And eventually this high-risk behaviour got found out and he had to be removed from leadership. So what is it about an environment we create where a young up-and-coming, I'm sure sincere servant of God who believed he was doing all the right things moves to a place where he's on a pedestal and when you're on a pedestal, I'm pretty safe with that, my pedestal's not very high, I don't have far to fall. There's two things going on there. One, that you start to believe your own story about your importance and the other is that people who might even challenge his behavior won't because of who he is and that compounds the problem and then the behavior escalates and the next thing you know his world implodes. Hopefully for that individual this will be a time of peeling back, reflection, taking ownership and having a deeper relationship with his creator God and recognised his flawed human nature. We can only pray that that happens. We can only pray that that happens. Now I'm conscious that I am pre-recording and you're looking at a screen and there's only so much you can look at my mush in the garage so I'm going to shorten this now. I'm going to skip some of the verses about the temptation. I think you got the idea there. But the challenge I want to leave you with today, it's a time for each of us to ponder. What do I need to fast from in my life that may be idolatrous? And if I, can, if I identify it and I'm going to deliberately make some changes, what am I going to replace it with? That is, the, that is for good and not evil. That is actually healthy in terms of my ongoing faith with Jesus. That is, that is to the benefit of those around me. That is the benefit of myself. That holds me to account. And ensures that I'm at peace with our God with one another, and at peace with yourself. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the imagery, or the, the story of uh, the temptation of Jesus. We see the very human experience, the, the hunger, the thirst, the vulnerability, and Lord, that the, just the temptation, the way the devil just discreetly says, hey, quite scripture at him, speaks to his vulnerability, why don't you get the angels to help you, speaks to our egotism, I can't offer you all this in the world, which was a bit of a furphy anyway, but we see that Jesus holds true to you and doesn't get caught up in the egotism and he's engaged in such a way with you that this becomes a place of testing and greater strength and depth and preparation for what lies ahead. And may that be so for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks. I hope you can make the most of your lockdown until Thursday. Mm -hmm.